Um, Richard Neal is a retired four-star general and served from 1996 to 1998 as assistant commander of the Marine Corps after graduating with a uh, BS in history and education from Northeastern University in Boston. In 1965, Neal was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps and spent the next 35 years commanding at every level. During his time in uniform, he also went on to graduate from the National War College and earned his MED from Tulane uh, University. He served two tours in the Republic of Vietnam and during Desert Storm. He served as the Deputy Director of Operations for uh, General Schwarzkopf as well as Central Command Briefer. His decorations in include the Defense Distinguished Service Medal, Silver Star Medal with Gold Star, the Defense Superior Service Medal with Palm, Bronze Star Medal with Combat V, and um, is that how you say it or you say it? Yeah. five? and the Purple Heart. Since retiring in 1998, he has been president of three intellectual prop, uh, property licensing companies. He was a senior mentor for the United States Marine Corps for five years and is currently a senior fellow at the National Defense University. Is that up to speed? Um, you still, are you still the um, senior fellow at the National? I am. Okay. The general also served as the chairman of the board for the Military Officers. Association of America and is presently on the board of directors for several companies and sits on the board of trustees for Norwich University. So welcome and everybody online, welcome. Um, and the floor is yours. Okay, great. Well, I'm supposed to say I'm glad to be here, so I'm glad to be here. It's great, to, <laughs> great to see everybody. Um, I asked Edwin when he asked, uh, when he uh, called me up, uh, sent me an email requesting me to be here. I said, well, what do you want me to talk about? Do you want me to talk about book or do you want me to talk about how I got to the book? Um, I think I'm probably going to do a little bit of both if that's helpful, uh, particularly for folks that may be thinking they may want to eventually sit down and, and write a book. The only thing I, I put down here, uh, writing a book is hard. <laughs> that's my Boston accent, but you have to put up with that. But it's, it's tough work uh, and it is work uh, and it, it, it takes time. The name of the book, this particular book, is called uh, What Now, Lieutenant? Um, it's a memoir of sorts, and I say sorts because it's a memoir of sorts, whatever that means. But um, it kind of traces um, my growing up in a small town outside of Boston, education, joining the Marine Corps, and it really, the book ends uh, with my retirement from the Marine Corps. So that's sort of the, the time frame in which the book was written. Um, after I retired from the Marine Corps, my, my kids kind of urged me to, um, to write something that would capture what had transpired over my 40 years or so. And um, they actually, it was funny, it was coincidental. I retired in 1998, and then this Christmas of 2000, two of my three children uh, gave me as a present the same book. And the name of the book was Legacy, a Step-by-Step -step Guide to Writing a Personal History, uh, which is a pretty good little book. Um, but that sort of showed me that they really were sincere in, in wanting me to, um, to sit down and kind of capture um, those events and moments in my life that were probably worth sharing with someone. I found that I was in a Christmas, not a Christmas card, but in a, in a gift store buying uh, some cards for my wife. Uh, uh, greeting cards, and, and in one, in one, um, one of the cards caught my eye, and I opened it up, and there, and there was a quote in there, and it says, "We do not remember days; we remember moments." And it was by a guy named Cesar Pavese, uh, an Italian poet and writer, who also was a communist, but I won't hold that against him. He's since expired. But anyways, I thought that was great moments. I thought moments might be a, a great way of uh, kind of um, capturing my life uh, across the spectrum of growing up in a small town all the way to uh, finishing up in the Marine Corps as the, the number two guy in the Marine Corps. So that's kind of what I did. I, um, I sat down and, and created a laundry list in chronological uh, order of all of those events, i.e. moments, that I thought were worth pursuing and putting the book together. So that's kind of, that, that really was the impetus. It was an outline, for lack of a better term, but it really was just a list of events. Um, it got pretty long, but uh, then the competing demands of um, not being, uh, being out of the Marine Corps, I uh, had to earn a living, so I, I 
I turned to running some companies dealing with the licensing of intellectual property. That was all due to a cold call. It had nothing to do with the military, and that's kind of what I liked. I had made a decision early on that once I retired, I wasn't going to go back into the defense-related industry uh, because I hated those people coming in my office trying to sell widgets and things of that nature. It just didn't didn't satisfy me, and I had great job satisfaction during the Marine Corps, so I wanted to kind of do something different. Through the, by virtue of a cold call saying that they had heard I was a good negotiator, uh, I got into this company. You'll always remember when you usually turn on your TV and you're, you, you hit the remote control on your TV, on the volume bar on the bottom of your TV, we owned that technology. And that was on every TV in the world almost, but in the, in the IP industry, uh, until they get caught, most companies just use the technology, even though they, are, they should be paying royalties to use that technology. And uh, so we had that technology. It was actually old. It was getting to where the patents were ready to expire. And in, in less than uh, two years, we made a substantial amount of money. Um, or the company did. I didn't make much money. In fact, my wife said, the great negotiator, I was getting a, a retainer, and I didn't do too well. <laughs> but after that, because of the success of that company, we formed. We were asked by the three companies that co-developed MP3 technology, if you're familiar with that. And uh, that's, again, ubiquitous all over the world, and just about every, uh, from your cell phone to whatever. Uh, and they asked us to, they outsourced the licensing function. So basically we, we went after the Sonys of the world, the Microsoft, the Apples, the Dells, everybody, uh, and told them they were infringing the patents and that they had to take a license. And we ended up with about 1,500 licensees and um, a very hugely successful uh, program in the billions, not in the millions. Again, the great negotiator, not a millionaire, believe me. <laughs> So that, being a, a senior fellow at the National Defense University, being a senior mentor for the Marine Corps for five years, and being on a couple boards, sort of uh, kept me busy. So I really put away that list for almost um, 15, 16 years. Uh, my wife's health uh, uh, kind of caused me to forget about full-time employment, so I stepped down and then, you know, trying to from an active type A lifestyle to uh, just sitting around the house. Uh, I, dragged, I, I, I recovered my list and started to work on it again. And um, I knew that I couldn't type, for this book, this is about 75 to 80,000 words. Uh, I knew if I were to type 60, uh, 70 to 85,000 words, I would never get done. It would never get done. So. What I did was I found a, a writer, a woman, uh, lived on the West Coast. I don't know how I found her, I think, through the Internet. And I contacted her and uh, I said, you know, I need someone to go down this list of events and moments and to capture the narrative by virtue of telephone calls. And so for about four, well, maybe five or six months, uh, she would call me and uh, she would be on item number six, and we would discuss item number six, and I could hear her t typing away like crazy. And then she would wordsmith it, and then she would send it back to me in word format, and then I would, you know, play with it, delete it. Uh, there was a lot of redundancy, as you can imagine, in a telephone conversation. So over six months, we basically developed almost an 80,000 word manuscript. Um, she was happy with it, I wasn't. I thought it was, it read like a diary. She did what I told her to do. In other words, she captured what my narrative was. But um, it was, I don't know, it just, it just didn't, it wasn't sexy, I guess, for lack of a better term. It wasn't something that you would pick up and enjoy reading. So um, I put it on the shelf again and um, you know, went about my way. And then um, um, again, during one of those in the winter months, not doing much, I, dr I pulled out the manuscript and started to really go through it, chapter and verse, editing it, um, shortening it here, taking out more of the redundancies that were still in there. And, and it came out, you know, I kind of liked what I had. I didn't think it was publishable, but it was, it was interesting and it kind of got, you know, it was me. I could feel like it was me telling the story. So somehow I found this woman, I think I went to a writing class at the community center and I might have got her name through, you know, when they send out 
you're always getting internet, uh, you know, advertisements of stuff. I think I caught her name, and so I took a risk and, and contacted her, and I said, you know, I've got a manuscript here. My real concern is it, it's sort of, and I use the word sterile. I don't think it really, it's not marketable. I wasn't really looking to market it as much as I wanted to get the, word, the, the message out that I thought the book uh, contained. So I sent it to her, and boy, she came back. She came back and she creamed me. You know, I mean, five-page email. I have it here. I'm going to read you a couple of things out of it. But five-page email, and she really. Whoa, five pages. Yeah, five pages. <laughs> when you write five pages, you know. Well, well good. <laughs> I mean, That's good crazy. proofread. Yeah, I mean, That's she. Good she didn't proofread. She just. She just captured it. I mean, let me read you a couple of stuff. She said, let me give a little background on why people read today. They read because they hunger for good stories. It's that simple. And the best, most interesting, most exciting stories play on our emotions and bring a cast of characters to life. Clearly your story hints at emotions involved in living the life you have led. Indecision, fear, love, brotherhood. We might imagine what you and others felt, but the scenes necessary to share these emotions with a reader are in these pages. Bang, right in the forehead. <laughs> Nonfiction writers know that journalistic writing, just the facts, details, can only reveal so much about a person's story. So they use fiction techniques and bring events to life for the readers. This means using dialogue and showing character, real people in the case of a memoir, interacting. This also means letting the reader in on the emotional reactions of the central players of the story. You do this in a few places in the book, but largely you stick with telling your story by listing events and dates. My list, my complaint about my manuscript was in the beginning. You may have heard the writer's rule, show, don't tell. Showing means fully developing scenes to enable, enable the reader to feel they are there, in the moment, experiencing what is happening. It's a very powerful tool. Showing creates realism and helps readers fully understand the life and experiences you are trying to portray. You know, it's really, uh, it, these were so helpful. I mean, you know, it's kind of like, uh, an epiphany, you know, I said, oh my God, you know, this, this lady has nailed it, yeah. Would you mind reading that vignette again, that sentence again? The, sh the sh oh, um, show don't, okay, where it's show don't tell. You may have heard that writer's rule, show, uh, you might have heard the writer's rule, show don't tell. Showing means fully developing scenes to enable the reader to feel they are there in the moment, experience what is happening. It's a very powerful tool. Showing creates realism and helps readers fully understand the life and the experiences you're trying to portray. Makes sense, doesn't it? It's really good. She says, if an Thank event you. is important, take the time to create a fully developed scene. This means show us what you remember or can reinvent of the dialogue between people. You do this in some places, particularly later in the book, but rarely do you make your people come to life by showing them in action or talking. Simply by saying that something happened isn't enough to engage readers. We need to feel we are witness to the event through your ability to recreate the scene on paper. When you see characters weep, cry out in pain, proclaim their love, stifle an angry urge, then we believe they are real people and we sympathize with them. It also makes the reader more aware of the conflict at work in real life. Conflict is what makes a story. A life without any evidence of conflict doesn't feel natural. And this is we, her, her and I disagreed a little bit about later on during the writing process. I am absolutely convinced that you have faced many difficult times during your life, but we're seeing very little of this here in this book. A series of career steps toward and mentions upward and mentioned challenges without developing them in a visual and emotional way for the reader doesn't doesn't bring the true you home to the reader. Seeing what works for other writers and one of the best is one of the best tools we author authors have. Notice the balance of dialogue, action, and narrative. 
some of your best scenes reflect a strong balance of these skills. For instance, the Battle of Gatlin's Connor is very moving. It's scary and dramatic and feels quite real, but it's there and then gone quite quickly, and very few scenes in the book approach this level of good storytelling. When you decide to include an event in your book, ask yourself how you can make it visual and real to the reader. How can you put the reader there in the moment and make it come alive for you, for them? There's a couple other things. But before you put that down, it was action, dialogue, and then there was a third thing. I don't write as fast as you speak. Mm -hmm. You try to get better. When I, I see. Uh, I know. Step back to oh, it. Oh, balance of dialogue, action, and narrative. Narrative. There yeah. we go. Yeah. She kind of said, uh, in quote, she said, an editor once cornered me at a publishing party and said, I enjoyed reading your novel and working on it. Hmm. It's interesting. Your characters always seem so nice. <laughs> I thanked him, thinking it was praise, and only later realized he was tipping me off. I was, I was cleaning up everyone. There was no evil, no discord, no realistic negative side to my people. And the writing was, when it came down to it, technically fine, but also boring. It's sterile. It's a great email. I mean, <laughs> she said, I'd love to get more in insight. And this is the one that really got me going. I'd, lo I'd love to get more insight into other people in this book. Kathy, my wife, your children, other men in the Marines. These seem almost cardboard figures without any real depth to them. They're shadowy and mentioned almost in passing. Very few people are given much time or detail or allowed more than a few lines of dialogue. So that, when I received this, you know, I sent her back at it. Anyway. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't have motivated me at all. <laughs> I'd, have been done. I'd have started a new career. Yeah, no, no, it was great. You know, it was what I needed to hear. Yeah, I, I, I kind of, um, I sent her back an email and I sent it out, whew. <laughs> you know, with a, a couple, you know, uh, exclamation points and I said, you know, uh, I'm a Marine and Marines don't like to lose and I feel like I just lost this battle. So she got a kick out of that. But we had a great relationship. But that was, a, that was the perfect um, ointment, I guess, to, to cover over, uh, you know, a poor attempt at being a, a writer. And, um, and, and, and that was what, it, it was wonderful that she did that and, and took the time to do it. And it was from that that I then uh, I, I brought out the manuscript again. And, and I did as she had suggested. I tried to bring my characters to life. I tried to, you know, my, I didn't tell, I started to show. And that's, that's really what turned the book into what I think is something uh, Ed's my best uh, supporter. It's a real and easy. Want, it's a real easy read. I want y'all to see the video like when you're done, mm -hmm. and you can narrate with it, so you can see what I mean. Because yeah. now, when I read it, the people, it, I can see what she's saying. Because all the people, because I've I read it, are now. They, I feel like every person is a person. Yeah. You know, they're not just like this guy on the front of the book. That's me here, and this is John Prickett. Eventually, he was the best man of my wedding. Two hours later, he was shot twice. I thought I was going to lose him. But you know, I didn't. I didn't convey that as well as I could. But you know, along with John being short, when we went in, we walked in with seven officers. Only three of us walked out. Uh, and so you can just kind of you, you, you should be able to tell that story. And that's where you got to show and not just tell it. It's easy to tell it. It's much. It's much easier because it's clean. You just kind of tell the story of what happened, hour by hour, minute by minute. But when you start getting into the personal part, when you talk about John Prickett and bleeding, and I'm trying to stop the bleeding, and the guy holding a compress gets shot, those things, you know, they bring the story alive and make it almost compelling. And so it's kind of that's that's kind of, and that's only one that's only one third of the book. Uh, but that, what transpired during those six hours when I was in heavy combat, really created the prism through which I, I, I led the rest of my life. I saw things through that prism. And so that's what the story is kind of, that's the launching point. The what now lieutenant, you might say, well, how did you get the name of the book here, Four Star Journal, why would you write what now lieutenant? Well, when you went into the Marine Corps, when I went into the Marine Corps, 
I went through a program called a platoon leaders class, sort of like ROTC. And uh, you could go for one 10 week segment one summer, or you could go two six week segments over two summers. And upon graduation from college, you would be commissioned a second lieutenant. I opted for the two times because I, uh, our family, we didn't have much money, and so I, I, I was working, I was a commuter. I commuted about 30 miles to college every day, and, um, and I worked when I came home. So, as a rubbish man, not very sexy, but I was a rubbish man for six years. So, uh, we, um, so I, I, I learned about all of those things, and, 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 and I lost my train of thought there where I was going, but. Um, where you're going is, where did you get the title? Yeah, so so I did the two week, the, the two six week increments, and even during those two six week increments, the whole purpose was to weed out those that they really didn't think were probably either motivated or of the fiber that they wanted to be officers of Marines. Then upon graduation and taking the oath of office, I went to what they call the basic school, and that's where every officer goes upon commissioning. And now you're an officer, but they're training you how to be an officer. Right. No longer a weeding out process, you're in. Uh, you're under contract for four years at this particular time. So I went, in, so I went to, down to Quantico for six months. And all during that six months, they would try to put you in position where they could kind of record your actions or lack of action to instant. It might be something combat related, it might be uh, a DUI from one of your people, it might be a family problem, or it might be the guy uh, doesn't show up for work, okay, where is he? And, and asking that second and third order question, why were you late? Maybe he was in an accident, maybe his wife was sick. In other words, trying to trying to see and develop in you a, an empathy and also a leadership uh, a feeling for taking care of the people that you work with. And so that's where, that's where one of the things was it was always like, what now, Lieutenant? You know, you're always waiting for that, that uh, staff member to say, okay, what would you do? What now, Lieutenant? And then when I got into that tr horrific battle I talked to you about uh, just after this picture was taken, I guess, um, uh, John Prickett was right in front of me. We were running back trying to get to the command group to help them in the firefight. He was hit, the guy behind me was hit. They missed me, uh, tried to get John. I'm doing stuff that a corpsman's supposed to do, but there was so much firing going on, I couldn't get a hold of the corpsman, so I'm wrapping him up. The kid holding the thing, he gets hit. So I look up and I realize, everybody's looking at me, and, they realize, and I realize all of a sudden, hey, you are it. It's your what now, Lieutenant moment. You are now in charge. You're the commander. I'm, I'm now the platoon commander. I was just the forward observer, you know, attached to him. So I was now the platoon commander. And so I had to take action. You know, I had been trained on it at basic school, the same as John Prickett had, but now it was my responsibility to look out for these 40 kids. Later on, if you read in the book, you'll find out that I took over the company because the company commander was killed. Uh, the Ford Air Controller was killed. Was this Vietnam? Yeah. And so I would now became a corpsman, a platoon commander, a company commander, a Ford Air Controller, in addition to being the Ford Observer. So all of those things coalesced in a matter of minutes. And, and, and that's what kind of, okay, what now, Lieutenant? So that was the, the moment in time that really generated the rest of the story, so to speak. And I thought, and I know we have a question answering, I thought that was like, um, you know, life, when life hits you and you have to do something, you know what I mean, like, the whole, I can't say, that's not in my job description. I thought that was, if you read that part of the book, you didn't have time to say, that's not my job description. Yeah. You yeah. just had to. Not in Nam. Yeah. yeah. Korean exactly. War, a little bit different, yeah. but Nam, no. Yeah. yeah. That so, was a good moment. So then, uh, um, that's where the, the name came from. Obviously, I, I wrote the book because my kids had, had asked me to do the legacy book. And then, of course, the, the other reason is I wanted to uh, make sure that what had transpired during this six-hour battle um, got recorded somewhere. And that, in fact, people would know about the heroics of the people who were involved here. One of the lieutenants that was killed won the Medal of Honor as a result of his actions during this time. 
John Bobo. Posthumously? Yes. He had his leg blown off at the knee, and rather than get um, um, medevac, uh, he had them put a tourniquet on it, and he stuck it in the ground to stop the bleeding, and he held off the bad guys until, uh, until he was overcome. Uh, so there was a lot of heroics there, uh, Corporal Jack Laurinaitis, uh, you know, just ma amazing things. He too was killed. Captain Gatlin, of course, the company commander, he too was killed. So I mean, there was a, a lot of things that were, I didn't want lost in history because uh, it was so important that they be recorded. And then, you know, the title, I've already told you about that, so that, that puts it in place. And then what did I want to take the readers take away from the book? Um, I think I wanted them to, to um, obviously take away whatever they might from the book, but at the same time they might understand uh, what I call uh, eyeball level leadership and its impact with people. Um, the importance of taking care of your people and looking out for their welfare, not just as a nice pithy phrase, but uh, the reality of that as part of a leadership dictum. And then, you know, uh, as I used to say, you got to grow where you're planted. A lot of these young guys and gals, they just kind of they're always looking for what's next, where in fact they should perform wherever they are at that particular time and grow where they're planted, and then they'll be taken care of if in fact their performance uh, merits it. And then uh, I, once I had taken my five-pager and uh, put all this stuff in there and decided to make my characters real and, and, and full of life, um, I, I, I got a hold of this publisher here. Uh, he did some small editing. I'm a short chapter reader. I like to have books that have short chapters. I hate to get caught in the middle of a 30-page chapter. And then, so I decided on the, on the chapters. And then over the years, I had collected a lot of um, uh, quotes that, um, uh, that I would use in speeches because I've given a lot of speeches. And so um, I decided that I, each chapter I would uh, start off with a quote from Bear Bryant to uh, Bobby Dylan to whatever. I mean, I run the whole gamut there, uh, uh, as you'll see if you, if you read the book. And so each one of the quotes that uh, begin a chapter, I tried to make sure they related to the narrative that was in the chapter. And I think I've succeeded just about at the 99.9% .9 level. So short chapters, the quotes, and um, that was about it. We, the publisher did some minor editing. He did some wordsmithing. It was really good. Corrected some of my punctuation. And then we shared some uh, video, uh, some pictures that I had that I wanted to put in the book, throughout the book. And, uh, and then it was done. Um, I read it. Uh, you know, I got the advanced reader copy, and I sent it out to about five or six of my folks. I actually sent it to the lady that sent me the five-page email. Mm -hmm. And uh, she liked it. The only thing she, she and I disagree with, she said, I don't, you never get into any conflict. And I said, oh, wait a minute now, you haven't read my book the way, I, you know, she's not military. So I said, you got to realize that when you do things in the military that are contrary to what the more senior pr person is, that's a natural conflict and it's a risk situation. In other words, you're putting yourself at risk when you're not, you were reading a book, uh, a four-star once said to me when I was giving a briefing, he said, stop. That's the problem with you, Neil. You're an operator. You're naive when it comes to how it's supposed to work. And of course, my Irish temper took over, and I just looked him in the eye. I said, I might be, I might, might be naive, sir, but I don't think I'm wrong. Well, that, that could be a showstopper for <laughs> future growth in, in any service. And, uh, but she didn't understand that. And once I explained it to her, she said, ah, God, yeah, now I see what you mean. And there are a lot oh, of. Oh, this was the female four star. No, this is just a. Oh, the you're you're talking about the, 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 the she the, is the lady the, is the, the oh, yeah, my lady here. Okay, sorry. sorry. So, um, and there are a lot of instances in there where where probably the easier way was to go along with the flow, but if I didn't think it was the right way, then I had no hesitation to say, wait a minute, that's got to change. So she wanted to see more battle. Uh, I think she, I think she was more of a fiction writer. Uh -huh. So she would, no, she wasn't looking for battles as much as conflict, and conflict could be. Also, that there were a number of very, very close associates that that, that were killed in that battle. Um, to make to make the reader really feel how poignant it is to to lose friends that close, 
Could you go back into the narrative and find ways to humanize those people, either through conflict or maybe something about their past, which made them I didn't. Real? Um, I did that a bit um, when I talked about each one of the individuals that were that received awards as a result of the heroics that they did. I, I like John Bobo. You know, I said, you know, it's, I described him as a person, and then I said, you know. I really thought he would have been, his real calling was to be a priest, you know, something like that. So I made him much more alive than yeah. Gatlin the same way when he talked to us before the battle and, you know, hey guys, I think if my instincts tell me anything, we're going we're gonna to run into a, a bunch of bad guys. And so, yeah, I did that in some sense. And then uh, I got into a reflective mode post-battle about the losses and the losses of friends and the impact and why why were some wounded and some were not wounded. So there was more reflective type move uh, as to, um, uh, and then during one segment, I uh, after the battle, I, I realized that you know everybody is just you know out straight. They're, 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 it's the first time they've lost friends on their left and on their right, and uh, as we all had. And so I called, I had my, uh, another lieutenant, I said, get all of the remaining leadership up here. I need to talk to them after the battle. You know, we were still out in the field. You know, we hadn't even met back the dead yet. And, um, you know, I, 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 I guess I consoled them in, in one sense, but at the end I said, you know, you got to remember, you got to go back to your people and to remind them, the Marines, clean their weapons and be ready in case we have to fight again. So it was kind of a, you kind of had to switch gears. You had to, at the same time, pat them on the back for a job well done and, uh, and console them over the loss of friends and, and, uh, and fellow Marines. And then at the same time, kind of turn it back and say, yeah, but it, you have to go back and tell your people, number one, commend them for what they did, but number two, make sure they're, they're ready to go again in case this thing starts up again. So it's kind of, I guess that's kind of answers your question a little bit, I hope. Mm. You know, um, you mentioned earlier also said that that one of your reviewers said that your characters were too nice. Yeah. <laughs> which puts you into a kind of difficult situation because you gotta find things which are not necessarily nice. And you don't wanna screw up anybody's reputation. Yeah. Right? And so you have to look for for legitimate conflicts which don't make them look as if they have yeah. characters. But, but but conflicts which are normal, which are expected, and you can still sympathize maybe with what it's not. That's a that's not a not an easy thing. No, it isn't. The, the thing about uh, you make your characters too nice, that was actually leveled at the lady that wrote me the five-page uh, email. It was her, her novel that she got to be, uh, you're too nice. But she was implying by that that my characters were too nice, too. Yeah, and that is a balancing act. That's kind of, because, you know, they're all, uh, with the exception of Schwarzkopf, uh, all of these folks, uh, all the characters in my book are alive and well, thank God. But like Schwarzkopf, I can still remember, you know, uh, he was noted for having a really terrible temper. I mean, he and I got along famously, but I mean, he had a terrible temper. And um, one of his, and I say it in the book, I said one of his shortcomings was that um, if that temper took, temper, temper, temper took place, um, you know, with, with seniors and subordinates, he might chew out a senior right in front of subordinates. Well, that's a no-no in, in leadership at 101, you know, but he did it. And I, and I made mention of the fact that he did it. I said if he had a shortcoming, this was it. You know, he, he, number one, he had a temper, and then number two, uh, he was notorious for chewing out uh, seniors in front of uh, subordinates. So, you know, I, I gave him a little nick, but I mean, overall, I loved the guy, and uh, he, was, he was a man for the moment, you know. And then I talked about a lot of the other generals that were working for him during, that, during the war, and you know, I made a, a kind of a, a blanket statement saying that uh, it was really interesting that if you looked at these different generals, none of them were the favorites of their particular services. Uh, they were probably on, they were put out to different locations, more put out to pasture. Uh, you know, yeah, he's a three star, but let's put him out here until he retires. Uh, you know, uh, Horner, who ran the Air Force. He was down at Shore Air Force Base, I think, for either six or eight years. And you never go to any place six or eight years if you're an up-and-comer. And that was just a place to park him until he went home. Switchkov, he was at uh, the Pentagon. 
he, uh, um, he was like a bull in a china closet in the Pentagon. And so they said, well, let's send him down to the place. Let's get him four stars because he rates four stars. A brilliant guy and, you know, wonderful career. Let him go down to CENTCOM. Nothing ever happens down there. <laughs> so down he goes. And then uh, General Boomer, who was in the Marine Corps, uh, three star, uh, was not a favorite of General Gray, the commandant. And so they sent him out to California, where, uh, no, actually, yeah, out to California. And, um, you know, that, nothing ever happens out there. All the action's on the East Coast. So you kind of got all these different people, you know, and I nicked a little bit by that overarching statement, but, you know, the facts spoke for themselves. But I didn't nick them in a sense because at the end of the chapter or wherever I said, you know, it's amazing that Schwarzkopf and these four or five generals all coalesce so well and develop, you know, such a camaraderie and a work ethic so that they complemented each other, so that they performed, you know, amazingly during Desert Shield and Desert Storm. So, yeah, it, it is a balancing act for sure. You had a question way back there. Yeah, then. I did. Um, I got two, Nick. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first one, I was just sitting here thinking, listening to the story, um, how difficult it must have been to really go back in the emergency, you know, things that happened in the past, and I was wondering how challenging that was when it came to PTSD and traffic, really relive those memories and put them down on paper, which will always be in front of you now. Yeah. Um, well, I think a lot of people, like, yeah, that's a good point. I think a lot of people say that by getting them out, it, it's actually to the advantage of the individual. In other words, if you keep them internalized and you torment over it because uh, you, the folks around you don't understand what's going on. Um, the PTSD, you know, I, I can't speak uh, with any authority of that. Uh, it, it, it's kind of amazing that the stuff that I talk about in here that I'm not a, a viable, maybe I am, <laughs> I don't know it, but I mean, I'm not a candidate for PTSD. Or uh, there were some, uh, Doc Braun, who won the, the Navy Cross, the nation's second highest award, and he was a corpsman. Um, you know, he's had problems, and, and some of the people in his book have had problems, uh, alcohol-related, not so much drug, but more alcohol. Um, um, but I think there was a real value of writing all of this stuff down, you know, capturing those moments that I talked about. Um, as I told Ed earlier, uh, before you folks arrived, um, I've read the book a uh, lots of times. Obviously, I wrote it, but I read it a uh, lots of times. And every time I read it, I think of things that I should have put in there. Mm -hmm. and, and and similarly, a lot of people that have read it that are somehow connected to the book, either from my hometown or other places, ah, oh, you should have put this in, you know, or you should have put that in, you know, those type of stories. Um, uh, and when I got the advanced reader copy and I sent it out to some guys that were with me during this battle to make sure that I had a factual, and, and, and if they thought of some things that I might want to include there. Um, I didn't really get any, you know, one guy said, you, you said you, had, you shot the guy with an M16, it was really with an M14, you know, something I, would, I didn't even think about. But I mean, most of the stuff, um, I have thought of a lot more that I would write about. I could probably pull about three chapters out of here and write another book on each one of the chapters. I don't know if I'd want to do that or not, um, but there is enough in there that, uh, and, and in fact, she, the lady said, you've got some stuff here, she said, have you thought about two or three books rather than just one book, you know, instead of covering that whole time period in one book? Uh, she mentioned you ought to think about maybe on, you know, a couple books. Second question. Yeah. It's, re it's in reference to the email. Um, listening to you reading, I'm like, I'm not sure how I would have responded to it. It would have been motivational for me. Um, but my question is, me, I'm, I got rough draft in the book, okay? And my biggest challenge is motivation. Yeah. Okay, and I'm, I'm easily distracted sometimes. So, um, is it possible to bullet point that email? Because I think it's something that can help me and maybe. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Yeah, I could. Oh. I could break it out. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to share it because you know it's it's uh, right. just that's, professional that's courtesy. I don't want to share who wrote it. But yeah. I mean, uh, she was 
she was the tipping point for me. I mean, if I didn't get that, right. I, I probably would have exactly. never even uh, gone. I mean, she she basically did it. I've never met her. Uh, I've it talked to her on the phone. Like she pushed you to a point that you didn't want to go at first. Yeah. Well, and she did. Well, no, question. it was more. I was a rookie. You know, I wasn't a writer. I didn't have any real training in writing except for college. You know, you write your stuff, and then when you're in the military, you write Marine Corps. And what's that mean? Short, concise, nothing but the facts. Jack Webb. You'll remember Jack Webb, but <laughs> most of these others won't. But, you know, nothing but the facts, ma'am. Uh, so, reruns. Huh? Reruns, yeah. <laughs> so, um, no, she was, uh, I was, I was searching and she, I just, I don't know how, I, I honestly cannot remember how, I, I think it was through one of those brochures or something, I just saw her name and I just wrote her cold by email. She returned almost immediately. I mean, uh, I think I paid her 500 bucks for that five page email, I guess. And boy, it was worth <laughs> an awful lot more. I mean, it was just, it was just perfect. I mean, she, she was what I was looking for and um, I probably could have saved time if I, I think in my, in my back recesses of my mind, I was hoping she'd say she'd rewrite it for me, but she didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, was, I think I was really kind of saying, oh, please, just tell me you'll do it, because she said, because she said in here, you know, this is, this is going to be tough to rewrite it. It would take considerable work and a learning process on your part. First, it would take you. But I'm not sure how willing you'll be to take on the job of a major rewrite. It depends upon what you ultimately want from this book. Uh, I can give you several strategies then if you like. We can talk more about it. Blah, blah, blah. But yeah, I mean, uh, I was, I was, I tell you, I was just whispering on high saying, oh, please tell me you'll rewrite it. You know, and then I'd let her ghost it or, or I'll even put with, <laughs> I don't care. Because, you know, I, it was, I was in, um, I was in a new, new, Position. I, I, yeah, I was I was a rookie, and uh, so I didn't know I didn't know what I didn't know, and she helped me find out what I didn't know, and, and I was able. I mean, I had all the you know I had all the information. The information was in here. It was getting it out, and not realizing that I wasn't getting it out in a in a in a fashion. It, it, when I read, except for the, the first manuscript, which I said looked like a diary. Well, I really carved that up a lot. And I was kind of comfortable with it after that carving job, but then she did a, you know, a real carving job and, and really got me back in, in the center line uh, where I could make it a much more readable book. I mean, if you read it, you'll you you blow right through it. It's only yeah, 200, yeah. 260. It's a quick read. Um, all of the I've had it reviewed by the Marine Corps publication, the Marine Corps Gazette. I've had it reviewed by a couple of newspapers and stuff. And, Everybody likes it because it's 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 an easy read and it's and the information is digestible, so it makes it much easier. Other questions, yes, yes ma'am. I have a couple things, please. Um, I drove three hours to get here because I was very. Pardon me? I said I drove three hours to get here. Oh my God. Um, because I'm I sorry the trip wasn't worth last it. Night <laughs> that you were going to be the speaker. And first of all, I'm a leadership and ethics professor. Oh, wonderful. Um, so I know that you have nuggets of gold for my students. In your book, and I would be sure to get it. Um, Whereabouts are you? At the State University of New York. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I also wanted to thank you for your service. Thank you. You know, 9 11 is on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> as we all know. And uh, I have my, my pen, and I wanted to know um, this isn't so much on a writing topic, but on a humanity topic. Um, Given everything that you have seen in your life, and given all that our country and each of us individually are wrestling with these days, what's the message of hope that you have for us? Message of hope. The Republic will stand. <laughs> you know, we've gone through these doldrums before. This one may be more pronounced uh, now with you can't even sneeze without someone saying Gesundheit across the hall so uh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic uh, I'm also pessimistic about some of the things that are happening around the world I mean the world front page of the Washington Post this morning you've got hurricanes you got earthquakes and you got politics I mean what a great combination I mean and uh, yeah it's worrisome um, 
but you know, good people will do good things. I think, I think we'll be okay. I think we'll be okay. Um, I, you're in ethics. I kind of, that's one of my hot topics is uh, people's moral compass. Uh, sometimes I'm not quite sure they can keep it center line. Uh, that, that, that's worrisome, but I think uh, we'll, we'll get through it. You know? And it's got to be invigorating being with young people because I'm on the board of trustees at Norwich. I didn't go to Norwich, but um, they wanted a token Marine. So, um, <laughs> it, it, you know, it's pro bono. So you fly up to Vermont and hotel and all that stuff. It's on my dime, but I really enjoy it because the, the kids are remarkable how smart they are and how attuned they are. Uh, but they need, they, need, um, they need to hear good stuff that I'm sure you're laying out to them. And, I, and I, that's, that's really, I'm not going to make a lot of money out of this book, uh, but I really want the message to get out. Uh, that's why I wrote it in the first place. And then number two, I'm, I'm hoping it'll, it, it, it's done quite well, to tell you the truth, for a small publisher. We'll see. May I ask one more question? Kind of is from a writing and a humanity perspective. And just in the short time I've been here, I heard you uh, mention two topics I'm keenly interested in, which is the power of dissent and the power of resiliency. Yeah. Because obviously, as a writer, when you got that, that was a message of dissent in yeah. some ways, right? Yeah. And you didn't just give up the project. You were resilient in the face of the dissent yeah. and rose to the occasion. And it fired me up even more, yeah. And resiliency is a big issue nowadays, as you well know. And a lot of people are really working at that full time. I'm, I just chaired a panel um, looking at recruit abuse for, in the Marine Corps down at Paris Island. They've had a couple instances down there. And so the Marine Corps outsourced, or I should say, signed a contract with Booz Allen um, to have their analysts look at uh, different things that the Marine Corps had pinpointed that they wanted to be reviewed. And then I had a panel of one four-star, one sergeant major, the senior enlisted leader, and then uh, two civilians, one uh, human rights lady, and then uh, another that's a, she was a deputy sec in defense somewhere in, a couple of years back. But anyways, we had the oversight of the product that they were putting together. And I thought they really missed the point because and I think the Marine Corps, either knowingly or unknowingly, had not given them the right marching orders because at the end of the day, the DI, the drill instructor, they did some of the things that would constitute either hazing, bullying, or things of that nature, counterproductive training. At the end of the day, yeah, he's the perpetrator, but the real, the real guilty ones are the leaders. In other words, where was the leadership? Where were they? Uh, some people call it intrusive leadership. I don't like that term. I like engaged leadership. Where were the leaders? Why, why weren't they around so that stuff like that doesn't happen? And that, um, that there's a command climate, so to speak, that, that um, would avoid things like that in the future. So it's, it's been an interesting thing. But uh, resiliency is, is something that we've been looking at a lot up at Norwich and the leadership labs up there. You might talk to those people up there. They really have some great stuff on resiliency. Thank you. Hmm? Well, <laughs> um, there, the first one, thank you very much for calling me. And lest I forget my manners, I come from a military family. And um, we, I have military, all four branches. And thank you again for your service mm -hmm. to our country. Very much so. There's a great book called No Man's Land by a professor at um, West Point. It's really kind of interesting because she uses that, she addresses the term of uh, thank you for your service. What do people mean when they say that to you? Kind of an interesting, it, it's a good book, it's a little book. Um, she's really a bright lady, but she's in, she teaches leadership and other stuff at, uh, at West Point. And uh, she would, you know, people get embarrassed, uh, active duty guys get embarrassed when they say thank you. Well, what are they thanking me for? You? It's my profession and stuff like that. So it's kind of an interesting take on that that comment worth looking at. So, well, thank you for taking the compliment. <laughs> and you had mentioned um, you initially st uh, uh, stated the the book Legacy Step by a Step by Step Guide, and then there to was personal history. Oh, okay. To personal that. history. Okay. Yeah. 
personal history, and then there was a second yeah, book. Legacy, a step-by-step -step guide to writing a personal history. Okay, and then there was another book by an Italian communist. Oh. What was the, what was the no, name of that? No, that's this guy, Cesar Pavis. He's the one that said, we don't remember days, we remember moments. Oh, oh, oh okay. Yeah. Uh, so I thought that was, I really agreed okay, with that it's because, you know, days roll by us, but it's those special moments. And I was using this what now lieutenant moment mm -hmm. as really the, the springboard for the entire book because it was the springboard for how I acted or reacted throughout my career in the military and to, and to include what I do now. So that's an excellent segue to my uh, next question, which is you used the expression eyeball leadership. Mm -hmm. And would you take a moment, if you would not mind, to extrapolate or expand on what that concept constitutes? Let me read you a little thing. In reflecting on the battle, I quickly realized in the span of 30 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes, I had gone from being a fort observer to being a corpsman treating John to assuming command of his platoon and maneuvering it, to being a radio operator talking to battalion, to taking over command of the company, while at the same time being the fort air controller. During those frantic and challenging minutes, 15 Marines were killed, including two captains, one lieutenant, four corporals, two lance corporals. I started to think through what needed to be done at the moment, except the fact that I had to get the Marines moving. It was now my responsibility to get everyone reorganized and functioning. In order to do that, I had to get them more focused on the present than on their fear, confusion, and grief from what had transpired. I understood the importance of walking around, being present in front of the men, and making sure that troops understood what had taken place over the past 24 hours. I told Dan to gather the platoon sergeants and senior NCOs so I could talk to them. Once assembled, standing or kneeling in front of me were men who had seen death and destruction unimaginable in its extreme. They were dirty, some covered with blood, their own or that of their comrades, in the detritus of battle. Their hollow eyes were red-rimmed and sunken, and were their cheeks they were etched with only what I could assume were the tracks of tears. This motley group, the surviving leadership of the Battle of Hill 70, stood before me and I knew I had to be careful with how I spoke to them. They had just lost their company commander, two of their platoon commanders, and many close friends. I don't have to tell you, what you, I don't have to tell you that you and your Marines did all and more during this battle. You who were on the hill, Hill 70, and those who fought their way to assist and rescue the command group. My eyes stung and I rubbed, rubbed them before continuing. We lost a lot of good Marines last night, but the enemy paid a heavy price. I paused again. Your Marines are tired and likely scared. For some of them, this had been their first taste of combat, of losing fellow Marines. I stopped because I felt it too. I looked back at them. We all lost comrades. Never will it be more important than now, than now that you help your Marines get through this. I need you to comfort while at the same time reminding them they are Marines. You must be ready to fight again if necessary. I let them know that as difficult as it would be to stay focused and to continue the mission, I depended on them to make it happen. I'm so proud of you and the Marines you and I are privileged to lead. Make sure you get my message down there. Some of the men that had, net now, that had knelt now stood as I finished. Battalion says transportation will be staged on the road nearby to move us back to camp. Before you move out, make sure you have your Marines recheck the area for any equipment and ordnance. I don't want to leave anything behind. We need to get everyone thinking, acting, and performing as Marines, which means cleaning their weapons and doing the things they've been trained to do. I looked at them, arranged in front of me. Any questions? There were not any, but the men, some of whom had seemed shaky minutes before, now seemed steadier. I nodded at them. Let's get on to it. On that day, I became a great believer in eyeball level leadership, mm -hmm. facing people, looking in the eye, and listening to what they had to say. I had to keep in mind that I was talking to human beings, tough young men who had just gone through a uh, life-changing experience, one that, the, one that would be with them for the rest of their lives. Eyeball level leadership was an imperative that from that moment on became the dictum by which I lived during my entire career as a Marine officer. And that pa those pages are what? 
I'm not going to give them to you unless you pay the book. Well, I'm going to buy. <laughs> I'm going to buy the book, but I just want to know which page. Sixty sixty one. And how has that? How did that vignette shape the course of your leadership strategically in the different businesses that you were in? Did that make um, sense? Concern for the people that work for you. I think, um, and that's what I, I said somewhere in the book, I said um, you don't have to be a general or a major or a colonel or a, or a, a, uh, a university professor or a president of a company. Uh, leadership comes in all sizes and shapes, but it really it gets down to concern and compassion for the people that work for you, being engaged when you're dealing with them on a routine basis. Uh, don't be afraid to ask him, what do you think? You know, that's when I, you know, a couple of words, what do you think? I mean, and, and you would be amazed. I was amazed throughout my career in the Marine Corps and also in the business world uh, subsequent to the Marine Corps. You ask people what do they think and, and they're, they're, they see things from a different level. They have a different view, and I'll say, of the battlefield. And uh, out of their mouths comes great wisdom if you're not afraid to listen to it. And. Um, so, yeah, I never had a, uh, I think that's really what I mean by I bought love of leadership and also um, it being the prism through which I, I saw the rest of my life. Well, um, sorry. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Wrap up, show the video that your publisher did. I'd like to also say thank you for your service. And what I mean by that is thank you for your sacrifice to the country and to people like me, to America, in terms of putting your life on the line for the good of ours. Thank That's you. what I mean by thank you for your service. I too come from a long line of, of military people. Uh, my husband's a retired Marine, and he wished he was here today. Uh, tell him uh, he said, I won't forgive him for not being here. Yeah. And all, and all the other <laughs> But one of the comments that uh, you, you stated, and this is more on a leadership, um, this is more of a leadership question. You said many young people are always looking for what next when they should just grow where they are planted, and and there's a lot in in, the, in that. And so, can you speak a little more about what you mean? Yeah, by I'll use it in the context of the military, and then I can conv and then I can transition it over to my job as a running a company, you know, in the intellectual property world. Uh, in the military, um, I think there's a uh, uh, there's a motivation. You know, they call them careerists, uh, that people want to get ahead, just like in any in any business adventure. Um, and they used to worry about what their next assignment would be. And my advice used to always be to the, whether it was a lieutenant or it was a captain major or lieutenant colonel when I was a general or whatever, don't worry about the next assignment perform in the assignment they're going to they're going to put you in for. Uh, usually in the fitness report that, that they, they write on someone, you have you put down three choices of where you want to go. Uh, hopefully you'll get one of the three. Hopefully you'll get number one, and you put them in priority. Hopefully you'll get number one, but if you don't, don't worry about it. Perform where they send you, and then go from there. You'll see in the book, I, was, I had just come back from Vietnam, my second tour, um, and I, and I, I had a rough, uh, I had another what now lieutenant moment during that uh, up in Cambodia. But I was at the school, I was at Amphibious Warfare School, and um, it's a six month course down in Quantico. And, and I've been, I was married now, I wasn't married the first time around. And um, I thought I was going to go out to the basic school where all young lieutenants go when they come out of college and be a tactics instructor out there. Well, you know, I got a call about the 11th hour and said, how would you like to go to New Orleans? And I said, uh, do I have a choice? And they said, no, not really, but you have to pass your orals first. So they said, get into your full dress uniform and, and come up to headquarters Marine Corps. So I went up there and they took me over to Capitol Hill. And I, and I, and I met the, the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, very powerful as far as the military is concerned. His name was F. Edward Abeer. And um, he was known around the country as the father of the junior ROTC program, those ROTC programs at the high school level. And um, the first junior ROTC in the Marine Corps, the Army has one and so did the Air Force and the Navy, I think, 
Um, the first one, that's where F. Edward A. Bear graduated from. Uh, so that's why it was the first one. Well, it was at, the, it had got to a condition where the Marine Corps was either going to pull it out or the school was going to kick it out of the school. And A. Bear didn't want that to happen, seeing it was his high school. And I mean, he was very proud of his high school. So he told the commandant, or asked the commandant, he said, let's see if we, if those, those organizations are run by retirees, uh, retired from the military. And uh, he said, let's, why don't we try an active duty guy and see if we can salvage the program. Well, I passed my oral, so I was the active duty guy. Um, and so that was a big disappointment for me. Here I was, highly decorated, you know, combat guy, and now I was going down to be to replace a retired guy at a high school. Did that look like a career enhancing building? <laughs> it doesn't sound like it's too career enhancing. It sounded like I was being cashiered for lack of a better term. But you know, it turned out to be a wonderful tour. I was able to get my master's degree down there. We were named the number one JROTC in the country before I left in the country before I left. And so it was, it was great. Uh, and I got deep selected for major to boot, you know. So, so, so that was a great lesson, object lesson to say, don't worry about where you, what next. Pl you know, grow where you planted, wherever they, wherever they assign you, just do the best you can. And people will recognize that. And, uh, and, and the rest is history. Make sense? Yes. It did to me, anyway. <laughs> great question. I got the video, so y'all really see. So y'all get some visuals. What's so this? Your video that you're Oh, that one. Uh, you want to background on this one? I, I didn't know it was. It. I didn't yeah. know it was made, but it was. Um, I didn't think it was effective unless you read the book. That's right. But you want to sit there so you can never went It never went anywhere. It never went anywhere. I mean, I still got. I, I guess I've got it. He's got it. I can't see it. No, I don't worry about it. That's my dad. He died when he was 41. Uh, yeah. I got sent to the farm because I got in some trouble, so I went to Henniker, New Hampshire, the only Henniker on earth. No cows. Captain Gatlin, he was killed. That's John Bobo here, John Prickett there. That's John Prickett there. Interestingly, he named his, one of his daughters after me, Callie Neal Prickett. <laughs> Grandmother, my grandmother lived to be 102. Talk God bless her. <laughs> John Bobo. Guess who? That's me. <laughs> That's when I was the second tour. I was an advisor of Vietnamese Marines. That's my son, Jesuit High School. That's the gang. That's the mascot. Hmm? That's the mascot. Yeah. That uh, was after the Boston Marathon. To boost morale, I started a thing called uh, Burn the General Run. And if you burn the general, beat him, you got a certificate saying I burned the general. And if you didn't, you got a certificate that said I was burned by the general. No. <laughs> Very clever. I just love a man in uniform. <laughs> this was when I was doing the briefings. Uh, if you hadn't read the book, I I did all of If Schwarzkopf didn't give the briefings, I was the guy you saw on TV every night. So I was I was the briefer. I wasn't trained to be the briefer, but because I was deputy for operations, I knew everything. So it was easy to get ready. We I mean, murder boarded every day, but I knew everything. So. What period of time was that? I, that's how I got my honorary doctoral degree. John Bobo, the guy that won the Medal of Honor, that's a ship he was. Is that Barbara Bush? Hmm? Is that better? Is that Barbara Bush? 
Yeah. Yeah. She sent me a note afterwards with a picture. She said it was an honor to be honored with you. What a nice lady. And she was the nicest lady. That's the USS Constitution. This is the Corman I talked about. I was given him the Navy Cross. That was over 35 years after the incident. They finally found the paperwork and we were able to resurrect it and get him the second highest award. And, yeah. Ed likes that. That's the only reason we should. I didn't, I didn't even know. I didn't even know it. He had it. When he told me about it, I said, "No, I don't think you got the right one." And then I remember seeing it. But when I saw it, I, I was worried because it didn't. Uh, the publisher did this uh, for his book. Uh -huh. um, a book it, tour. It was for um, to promote. I don't know. What he, he wanted to use it as a promotion. I said, "But you know, I." I really loved it, but I said, you know, the problem is, unless you read the book, it, there's no connection, there, it, it, there's no context, you know, in other words, you just see a bunch of pictures, so if you read the book and then you see it, then it really has, it It, it really is nice. Yeah, yeah, and I just wanted people to see, like, because you're very humble, like, all the things that you've done, I mean, if you go, if you go on C-SPAN, you can watch your old, I don't know if you ever watch your old, uh, briefings. Oh, yeah. And look at yourself, have you ever watched your old What you want to do is, there's, there, there was really, um, Saturday Night Live, uh, during the war, they did a skit on uh, on me giving the briefings. Really? And the reason they, the reason they did it is is because, you know, the, the stupid question time. Well, General, tell us uh, where the new where the new maneuver is, or where are you going to do, or where are you going to fight next? You know, and it was such a takeoff on it. I, I didn't see it because obviously I was in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. But uh, the press guys had seen it, and they said, ah, General, you got to see this. It's so funny, you know. But, uh, but, uh, and you don't have a copy of it? I don't know if I have a copy of that. I just remember them telling me, and uh, I saw it. You'll have to find it. it. Yeah, I'm sure you can find it. It's an old Saturday Night Live. Well, you know when you are Im Im memorialized, that was the word, if you're and memorialized then, by Saturday Night Live, you've arrived. You've arrived, is that right? You oh, have arrived. Well, Bravo. I, guess, I guess I've arrived, yeah. Bravo. I think there was another part in the book that I thought was interesting. I'm not trying to tell it all. But, uh, it was the mobster Whitey bought him a beer. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, that's a funny story. I, when I came back from um, Desert Storm, was because I'd been on TV. My wife told me, she said, you, you, you don't realize that you're on every TV, every radio, everything, because it was kind of the first time they had used um, a military guy giving the briefings. And it was either Schwarzkopf or me. Uh, we, we uh, Chairman Powell was really getting mad because we, we had a couple guys do it and they just didn't, they didn't come across uh, as well as uh, they wanted, so. They wanted to try me out, and Schwarzkopf said, "No, he's too busy. He's he runs the war room at night, and you know he seems like he's here all the time." So, so then the chief of staff said, "Well, I'm going to do some. Why don't he, why didn't General Neal and I uh, do too?" And uh, he he said, "Okay, we'll try that." And then then I did one, and it kind of went well. And so Schwarzkopf said after that, "Then I want General Neal." To, to do it from now on. So then I did it for the next month, or however long the war. So I did it unless Schwarzkopf came on. Uh, and it was it was a fascinating time because you, you just, at that time, we actually gave C-SPAN to the world. That's when, uh, not C-SPAN, but CNN. Before that, it was just that, that outfit, you know, no one really thought much about it. But the war really uh, gave CNN uh, new legs and that's, we all got used to watching real live uh, guys briefing and from Riyadh and Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and, all and so on. So it was kind of an interesting time. In fact, that, you know, 
a lot of publishers wanted me to write a book at that time. You know, sort of the inside story of being in the war room all the time with Schwarzkopf and, and all those things. But I was on active duty, had no, you know, I didn't know how long I'd be staying in, but I had no inclination at the time. But, uh, what do you got there? No, that's your briefing. I don't know if you ever watched it. There was no sign of Iraqi opposition. You ever watched it? Oh, yeah, it no. What <laughs> nation <laughs> was it? I used to have to do a five five minute read that of well, something that the, took over they had put together. And then once I did that, then I just took questions. But when you take the questions, you're going to ask. Brigadier General and 89 other officers. EPW Processing well, Center was quickly well, well, established on the whole, island, and they were ferried by helicopter to USS Ogden for further transports into Saudi Arabia. On ground operations, our forces remain arrayed throughout the uh, yeah, yeah, no, operations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for coming. Does anyone have any last questions before we wrap it up? It's almost two o'clock. Anybody? Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank Great. You. Well, thanks for coming. Thank you so much. Good.